Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Late's Online from the Natural History Museum. I'm Alison and I am your host for tonight. I am super excited, but also a little bit sad to be hosting the final Late's Online of 2020, but we will be back in the new year. And we've got an exciting lineup for you tonight. We've got an evening full of toxic trivia, all about the wild world of venom. Now, a little bit later on, you can test your venom knowledge with our quiz with Christina and Khalil. But first off tonight, I'm going to be chatting with three brilliant researchers, finding out about a whole host of venomous animals and also learning how and why venom is so useful. Now, if you're watching our stream live tonight, you can, of course, ask your own questions. We love to hear from our viewers, so please, please don't be shy. If you've got any questions at any point during our stream, pop them in the chat. We'll do our very best to get through as many of your questions as we can. But let's meet our three speakers today. We have, uh, from the Naturalist Museum, Ronald Jenner. Hello. Hello. Uh, we also, from the Naturalist Museum, have um, Ida Verdes. Hello. Hey. And last but by no means least, from Oxford Brookes University, we have Anna Nakaras. Hello. Hey. Hello. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. It's, it's brilliant. I can't wait to, to delve into our, our topic. But before we start, let's find out a little bit about each of our speakers. I'll let you introduce yourselves. Ronald, if we start with you, first of all, tell us what you do at the museum. Well, I've been very fortunate for the last almost 12 years. I've uh, been a researcher in our life science department, and I study really cool things like venomous invertebrates, uh, like the giant centipede that you see here uh, in this particular slide. I work on venomous worms and venomous crustaceans just to find out how these magnificent weapons evolved. You've got the best specimens. <laughs> and, and Ada, what about you? Um, I'm also at the Life Sciences Department with Ronald and I'm focused on marine invertebrates mostly. And right now I'm investigating uh, venomous marine worms called ribbon worms that uh, we'll be talking about more late. Yeah, I'm excited. I had never heard of ribbon worms before. So uh, this is a, a new topic for me. Um, and Anna, tell us a bit about you and your research. I'm sort of the outsider here because I'm a professor in anthropology at Oxford Brooks. I'm actually a conservation biologist and I happen to be working on one of the world's most endangered primates, the Javan slow loris. And it happens to be also the only venomous primate and it has some dramatic impacts on its conservation. So by the end of this talk, you'll find out why venom and conservation can meet. Absolutely, and it's it's a fantastic subject. Uh, but let's start off with uh, with with some technical stuff first of all. So, and it's 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 very at its most basic level. What exactly is venom? Well, venom is a chemical cocktail of components that do harm when you receive them. So, venoms are uh, injected into uh, animals, and the venomous animals use them for predation, for instance for defense or, or for competition. So it's uh, chemical warfare and venom is the weapon. And a very powerful weapon. And we, we tend to use um, terms, uh, the terms venomous and poisonous interchangeably, but they are quite different, aren't they? What, what is the difference between something that is venomous and something that's poisonous? Yeah, they're actually uh, two quite different terms. And um, to differentiate them, I uh, like to uh, remember a phrase that's uh, very easy. Um, so if you bite an animal and you die, then, then ani that animal is poisonous. But if the animal bites you and you die, then it's venomous. And so uh, here you have images of uh, different poisonous and venomous animals. And you can see how the venomous ones have uh, some means of injecting the venom like the, the scorpions or the snakes, they have fangs, they have stingers. So that's uh, the main difference. Venomous animals inject the, the toxins and uh, poisonous animals, you have to ingest it um, so that uh, it affects you. And we've got a, a, a little octopus there in the middle that's sort of between the two. Are there animals that are both venomous and poisonous? Oh, there are. And, and this is quite a rare thing 
But here, the blue ringed octopus in the middle is both. So uh, in the middle of its crown of tentacles, it has a little beak. It looks a bit like the beak of a parrot. And with that, it can bite its prey like little shrimp and paralyze them and eat them. But if you would be foolish enough to eat one of those, then the toxins that it uses to kill its own prey can kill you too. And incidentally, it's the, the same toxic compound that makes puffer fish sushi so deadly if it's prepared uh, inexpertly. Yeah, that's tritodotoxin, isn't it? Very, very nasty stuff. <laughs> it, it paralyzes you and it basically paralyzes your diaphragm. And what that does is you can't breathe anymore and that, that's not good. No. <laughs> now, when I when I think of, of venomous animals, I tend to think of things like spiders and snakes. But there is a, a lot more to it than that, a lot more variety of venomous animals out there. Even some that, that uh, yeah, that, that are, are almost cute. Anna, tell us about your, your uh, venomous species. So I, I work on the slow loris. This is a pygmy slow loris. Um, and they happen to be venomous. So it's something that local hunters know, that pet traders know. And in those, their venom is actually even one of the reasons they're used 100 traditional medicines throughout Southeast Asia. So you can have an animal that is surprisingly venomous because it's the only venomous primate. And um, in fact, it's, it's closely related to lemurs and bush babies, but there are lots of reasons why lorises may be venomous, um, partially due to one of the really unique foods they eat, which is gum. Maybe also because when they were moving into Asia, it was the same time as cobras, which we know are venomous and we think they may be partially mimicking cobras, but they're not the only venomous mammal. There are a number of other venomous mammals, um, including shrews, uh, selenodons, the, the platypus, and the vampire bat. And so uh, we will be discussing throughout this why these different groups of animals are venomous. Mammals are venomous, uh, but yeah, it's, it's not so common amongst mammals, but it's evolved multiple times. It has a lot of... The, the platypus always surprises me. That's an animal that seems to have so much going on and it's also venomous. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Ron, what surprising venomous animal do you have for us? Well, some of the animals, like Anna just said, are venomous and they're super cute. I mean, if you've ever seen a, a, a platypus, they're cute as well. But certain animals are beautiful and venomous. And I think we have a slide of one of these. Um, and this is a, a creature called a sea swallow. It's actually a, a sea slug, a nudibranch. And these guys float upside down on the surface of the oceans. They're about two centimeters long. And in their little finger-like projections, they have venom, but it's not their own venom. This is one of the rare examples in the animal kingdom where this creature steals the venom apparatus of another creature. So these guys eat Portuguese men of wars, these jellyfish that can sting you really nastily. And they eat their stinging cells store them in their finger-like projections. And when you're silly enough to pick one of these up, it can sting you really badly. So this is a nice illustration of uh, nature is beautiful, but but don't touch me. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, it's such a stunning animal, but yeah, yeah, be very, very careful. Uh, and Ron, you you also, uh, you have a, another example as well. And this, this one didn't even occur to me that it was venomous, the mosquito. Yeah. It, it is striking because it's so unimpressive in a way, but uh, mosquitoes are venomous just like, for instance, a Australian Thai pion is, and in almost the same way, it messes around with your blood clotting system. A snake may do this to kill you, so it can eat you, but the mosquito does this in a more surgical way, so it can actually stop your blood from clotting, and it can then suck your blood. So these flying insects uh, are venomous as well, and if you realize that, then the world is full of venomous creatures and they can fly too, which is, that's, that's not good. <laughs> and Ida, you work on uh, a group that we, we refer to as neglected uh, venomous species, don't you? Tell us about these. Yeah, um, so there are many uh, animals that are venomous and there are poorly studied. That's why we say they're neglected. There's not a lot known about them and there's actually many uh, animals that we discovered to be uh, venomous uh, later on, like we, the, we didn't previously know about it. Um, the group I'm studying right now, it's called ribbon worms. 
and they are a group of worms that's pretty diverse and uh, it's mostly marine species but there are some terrestrial ones like uh, the one you can see in the image on the left that's uh, hunting a springtail and uh, a few uh, freshwater ones as well and they are uh, very diverse in their their uh, forms as well so the terrestrial species that you can see there it's maybe about two centimeters long and a few millimeters wide but the one on the uh, right, it's called a boot lace worm. And um, that can be up to 50 meters long. It's actually uh, the longest animal on the earth. And, uh, and yeah, they're uh, not very wide, but they can reach really, really uh, huge lengths. I'm so glad you've introduced me to, to ribbon worms because they are really, really cool. And I had no idea that they existed. <laughs> no. Um, we, uh, I just want to remind uh, viewers before we go on that we uh, we will be taking questions from from you guys online. So if you've got any questions, do remember to post them in the comments. We'll we'll get through as many of them as we can. Um, now, all of these these different venomous animals, uh, it, it's occurred so many times. I'm assuming that that it's evolved independently um, rather than from a single source. How has venom evolved in these different animals? Well, if you Think about the most familiar venomous animals, scorpions, spiders, snakes, and most people, I think, realize that these groups have evolved their venoms three times independently, which is nice. But if, if you actually do a survey of the animal kingdom to mammals, you will notice that venoms have evolved at least 100 times independently, including their delivery systems. This is a, a tree, an evolutionary tree. Uh, it's quite small font, but it shows you that throughout the animal kingdom, more than 200,000 species have venom, and they evolved these uh, 100 times independently from non-venomous ancestors. So it is one of the most successful and most frequently evolved adaptations in the animal kingdom. It's, it's really useful to have venom. It's absolutely amazing. And uh, th thank you. You, just, you literally just answered a question that came through from YouTube from one of our viewers asking how many times Venom has evolved. So that was excellent timing. <laughs> and we did have a, another question coming a little bit earlier from um, from one of our viewers, one of our regular viewers, Noah, age six, um, asking, what's the most venomous creature in the world? Gosh. It depends. If, if you are a white mouse, <laughs> then I would say the Australian taipan. But venoms can be specific and they uh, may have an effect on some creatures and not others. For instance, snakes that specialize on eating birds have a venom that doesn't do much to mice. So it really depends on uh, what animal you're most interested in. And we've had a, another uh, a question come in uh, from YouTube, and this this one I think is is for you, Ida. And we've um we've got something that's that, that's going to answer this question quite well, I think, because someone was asking, how can a worm catch a springtail? It seems like that it, they'd be too slow. Um, so so um, Ida, we actually have a, a short video that we can show, and it brings us very nicely onto the the next topic, which is different ways that animals actually deliver their venom. So, so Ida, tell us about the ribbon worm. Yeah, that's a really, really good question because, yeah, they're actually very slow, as you can see here. <laughs> uh, but they have right there <laughs> uh, a sort of a tongue, let's say, that's called a proboscis. And that is actually the structure that they use to deliver the venom. So when they want to hunt, they just release these proboscis really, really fast and they um, use it to inject the toxins into their prey. And then they, they can just uh, pull the, the prey back to their mouth and, and swallow it. Wow. That is incredible. Very, very fast indeed. So yeah, not, not bad for a, a little slow worm. <laughs> 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 Amazing stuff. Um, so, so that's how the the uh, the ribbon worm delivers its venom. It's got that that proboscis. Yeah, ribbon worms um, actually use toxins for uh, two different purposes, uh, like we saw in the video for predation. And in that case, they use the the proboscis. They do have different uh, ways of uh, injecting the toxins. Some uh, worms, like the one in the video, have uh, uh, the regular proboscis that you just saw. Some other ones have uh, a tip on the proboscis that's uh, very, very sharp. And so they use this stylet, it's called a stylet, 
um, they use it to stab the prey and inject the toxins into the body. For example, if they uh, hunt uh, prey that have uh, more of a hardened uh, shell or something like that. Uh, and then there's other ones that have a proboscis that is branch. It, it has uh, many, many different branches, so they kind of extend it as a net, uh, as a venomous net to, to hunt whatever it comes by. Um, but then they also use uh, toxins for defense. And I, sorry, for, um, uh, yes, for defense. <laughs> And so in that case, what happens is when, when they feel threatened, they just start to release a large amount of mucus and that mucus has toxins uh, in it. So uh, the predators want, want to eat them. Um, Anna, how do um, mammals deliver their venom? Is it usually just biting? There's different mechanisms for mammals to deliver their venom. Most of them use their teeth. So the selenodon and the, the shrews, the Eurasian water shoot, the Eurasian water shrews and the American short-tailed shrews, they have grooves in the back of their teeth and the venom can flow into their victim just from their saliva. With the slow loris, they actually have to put their arms above their head, clasp them slight, uh, tightly together like a very good yoga student, and um, they lick a gland in their upper arm and they combine it with their saliva. And they also have grooves in their teeth that allow them to inject their venom. So it's a two system with saliva and brachial oil. And uh, the, the final way to inject venom is the platypus, which has a crural spur. So they have a little, a little spike on their leg and um, only the males have it or only the males use it during the bre breeding season to spike other males and inject them with venom in order to get their ladies. <laughs> and so here you can see, yeah, the, the vampire bats as well, they bite into their victim and they use a very long tongue to introduce their anticoagulant saliva in order to ingest blood. Ah, oh, that's that is really cool. So even within mammals, there are different ways of, of delivering venom. Uh, Ron, there are some animals employ very, very unusual ways, don't they? Yes, you did break up a little bit, but I think I know. Uh, you're um, yeah, hearing Croyd on the internet is not fantastic. We are bankrupt, of course. Um, uh, what you have in the animal kingdom, you know, if something evolves a hundred times independently, it will evolve different ways of being delivered. And you can see here, for instance, in this graph from our fantastic Venom book, on the left hand side, <laughs> you see a, an amphibian, you see a newt, and amphibians generally are weird. It. The newt here pictures its own side with its own ribs when it's in danger. It has toxic glands along the side of its flanks and then it breaks its own ribs through its skin so it can inject it. And that is a weird thing in amphibians. And there is just as weird a way of delivering it in frogs. I think you have a, a slide of that as well. It's a group of frogs which look really cute and they're called cask headed frogs. They have a, a boxy like bony head and you can see it here. They're really cute, big eyes. But they are also quite nasty. Here on the right, you see a fellow uh, venom researcher, a colleague of ours called uh, uh, Carlos Jarrett. He works in the Instituto Butantan, which is a huge venom research institute in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And he was studying these creatures. And you can see he's looking a bit apprehensively. He picked one of these up and then it started headbutting him and rubbing its head on his hands. And Carlos thought, oh, that's very cute, until he burst into tremendous pain for five hours. And it turns out that these frogs have toxic glands in the skin of their head. And you can see here in the photos, they have really spiny skulls. And these spines puncture the toxic glands, inject the toxins into your hands, and it causes the pain. But the remarkable thing is not just the bizarreness of how they do this, it's the potency of it. The frog on the left, the one with the beautiful big eyes, its venom is 25 times more potent and lethal to mice than the venom of Brazilian pit vipers in the forest. So it's good that these are small frogs because this is a really potent arsenal. And is this the, there, there are two species that do this. Are, are these the only venomous uh, venomous frogs? Are they, are they poisonous as well? Uh, so they are poisonous as well because the definition here is if you would eat one of those and you would ingest these toxins from their skin glands, you would probably or possibly also get sick. But we know only for these two species 
uh, scientists like Carlos Jarrett have studied the toxins. There may be many more out there. I mean, we haven't explored all venomous biodiversity yet. So this is why people who are listening and viewing this and they're interested in becoming a venom research biologist, there's lots to do. Definitely. And uh, Ron, I, I did uh, particularly love that little plug of your book that you got in there earlier. We've actually had some people asking uh, on, on YouTube the name of the book so that they can buy it. So, so it worked. The name of the <laughs> book is, of course, Unsurprisingly Venom. And this is the American edition. <laughs> um, I co-wrote this with my friend and, and colleague Ivan Undheim. It's available in good bookstores as well as uh, <laughs> Amazon. So, uh, Fantastic. Good plug. Just in time for Christmas as well. <laughs> now, we've got uh, quite a few questions coming in from our viewers. Uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, ask a, a couple of these before we move on. There's some some really interesting questions. Um, so we have a question from YouTube from Alexander asking, is the, the chemistry of venom similar in different groups or do different um, animals have very different types of venom? Who would like to volunteer? <laughs> I can I can answer that because actually um, uh, that's something that also has to do with the evolution of venom. And um, even though venom has evolved many different times independently, uh, many different animals use the same molecules to make up the toxins. So yes, there are uh, different groups that have similar chemistries. In the end, um, many times nature comes up comes up with the same solution because why not i mean if it works you might as well use it uh many times right so so yeah there are different uh animals that have uh same chemistries or very similar chemistries in their venom but um it varies a lot because at the same time there are other groups of animals that have uh different compositions different toxins uh even within the same species like different populations might have a different composition on, on their venoms. Can I, just a very short addition to this. Venoms evolved for badness. They want to cause physiological disruption. So if you want to hit the Achilles heel of your physiology, nervous system, blood clotting system, many of these independently evolved venoms hit the same targets. So a venomous snake and a mosquito and a leech and a tick may hit the same targets in your blood and your blood clotting cascade, for, for instance, uh, in one case to eat you, in the other case, so they can drink your blood. So, um, yeah. It's absolutely amazing. We had a great question come in earlier, for, and this one is for, for all of our speakers, actually. It's from uh, Alicia on YouTube. She was uh, asking, have any of you been stung or, or bitten or in any way affected by any that uh, any venomous animals and did do you have any advice on how best to treat the the immediate bite <laughs> uh, especially while diving Ida That's the end of that question uh, no thankfully I haven't been <laughs> beaten or stung by by anything other than a bee I think a long time ago <laughs> so um, <laughs> no, no no I haven't <laughs> What about you, Anna? Did you have you been bitten by your cute little venomous friends? I, I luckily wear gloves when I handle slow lorises, and I'm bitten almost every time. But I wear <laughs> gloves that are a size too large for me, so I always have a bit of glove above my finger. I give it to the slow loris immediately to bite, and the slow loris feels like it's killing me, and it's just soaking my glove with its venom. Uh, we always have an EpiPen. So one of the main initial causes of a loris bite is anaphylactic shock. And so we have EpiPens always in our capture kits when we're catching slow lorises to put radio colors on them or to do a health check. I was bitten once through a thin, just a thin glove. And I had a wound on my finger that didn't heal for several months. And I have a colleague who was bitten on her finger without a glove and has lost the use of that segment of her finger. And uh, I have another colleague who uh, went into severe anaphylactic shock and had there not been a local doctor available, uh, they would have died actually from the bite. Um, I've also bitten, been bitten by other things. Uh, and, and I think that my biggest advice is when you're stung, especially by insects or sprayed by insects, is to try to get a photograph of the insect or, or the, vic or the if it's a snake, try to, to identify what it is, 
because therefore you can get a treatment. If you don't know what it is, you can't get a treatment. So for snake bites, it's incredibly important to know what snake you've been bitten by and uh, take your phone, Have your no matter how scared you feel or stressed you feel. Uh, there are other steps medically to take, but I think one of the key, step, key steps is identification. Absolutely. Really, really sound advice. Uh, thank you all. And that was a, a great question. Um, we've got a question that came in from um, Kylie on YouTube as well. Uh, this one's about poison and, and venom. She's, uh, they're asking, did venom and poison appear at the same time or did one appear in nature first? Did one evolve first? Tricky question. My bet would be it's, it's a bit of a difficult question, but venoms evolved really early. Before animals became strong or smart or fast, venoms already evolved. Why? Well, they evolved first in the animal kingdom in jellyfishes, sea anemones, corals. These are creatures that are really vulnerable, slow moving or even, you know, fixed to the substrate. And they use venom for all kinds of purposes, competition, killing prey, defending themselves against enemies. So 600 million years ago, venom was already in the battle arena of the animal kingdom. With poisons, I don't know, maybe even older, maybe sponges, which are one of the most primitive groups of animals. They are full of toxins and they may use these toxins for defense as well. So that's, that's a question that deserves some research. Definitely, definitely. Really great question. I, I'm, I'm loving it. Keep it coming, uh, online viewers. You're doing a fantastic job. <laughs> but, um, but let's move on um, to talk a little bit about some of the different ways that venom is actually used in nature. We've, we've mentioned already uh, predation um, and defence with our, our ribbon worms. But, um, but Anna, the, the slow lorises, they use venom for uh, an interesting and quite a, a specific reason, don't they? Yes, slow lorises use venom against their own species. So they use it in battles to defend their territories, to defend where they live, their food, their mates. Both females and males are venomous. So females fight other females, males fight other males. And uh, the individuals you see in the slide, what's really, really sad is the really nasty looking guy with the blue collar, he's Fernando. And he actually killed the lovely the lovely boy on the other side, Aloma, in a battle over a, a lady. And so, and the lady rejected the winner. So it doesn't mean that just because you're venomous and you're powerful, you can, um, you can win what you want. So it's, it's very interesting that intraspecific competition is one of the rarest uses of venom in the animal kingdom, but it happens to be used by two different mammals, both the slow loris and the platypus use uh, venom for interspecific competition. And uh, yeah, and the other animals that do so are so distantly related, cone snails, uh, ghost shrimp. So it's very interesting use of venom. Mm. Um, and Ron, there are some, there are even more novel uses of venom, aren't there? Some, uh, some animals use it uh, in mating, the, the scorpion, is that right? Yeah, so this is also just like the question about toxic, sorry, poisons and venoms an area that, is, that deserves more research, but uh, quite a few scorpions, when they have their courtship, and here's a beautiful scorpion, they have an elaborate sort of dance routine. Um, and in some species, the male inserts its venom stinger into the female, but nobody really knows if he releases venom or if he does a lot or a little, but it does seem to quiet the ladies down. So it's almost used to make them doze out. Maybe this is important because they have very toxic venom. And so maybe when he uses a little bit of it, uh, there is less danger of them hurting each other. This is all speculation. So that, that's that's a really cool question to do research on. Another one, that venom, it's such a, a fascinating frontier, isn't it? There's, there's so many uh, potential yeah. questions. Um, and uh, ants also have some pretty interesting use of venom, don't they? Ants are bizarre. Ants are using venom. Um, ants are basically just um, bees that have lost their wings. And so like bees, they're venomous. But ants, different groups of ants use their venom for predation, to, to kill their prey. They use it for defense against predators. They use it for communication with each other, for instance, as an alarm pheromone, so that when one is in trouble, uh, the others smell the venom and come to rescue it. Uh, they use it... Uh, 
to anoint the inside of the colonies to keep uh, microorganisms that may grow everywhere under control. So it's, it's, it's like a Swiss army knife that they use for a whole bunch of purposes. Some ants are so crazy, they only like to make their nests in certain plants. And what they do is they sting other plants to death so that more of their favorite plants can grow. That is incredible. It's evil. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely amazing I'm, I'm learning so much tonight we're, we're getting so many uh questions through from our viewers we, we will try and get through as many of, of them as we can um but let's uh let's move on to um just talk a little bit about the physical impact of venom the victims themselves because it, it has some some very interesting impacts does the 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 use of the venom um does that does that affect the impact so for example if you're using venom for defense does it tend to be a painful venom um, or is it a bit more complex than that gosh in the case of the slow loris we have two two certain impacts the pain is very very high so um, we've done some research on the actual composition of the slow loris venom and it has the ability to cause the saliva alone actually of the slow loris has incredible ability to cause pain so even if they don't do this complex combining we have pain but at the same time when you combine them both you can get necrosis which is the damage of the cell tissue um, where after a bite a, a human or another slow loris can lose huge patches of tissue so in a single animal, you could have two different types of results from venom. Mm. It, it is, uh, if you want to generalize across the field of venom, the currency of defensive venom is immediate and memorable pain. So you would feel that, for instance, fish venoms are infamous for it. If you step on a scorpion fish or a stonefish, um, you will remember it forever because it is deeply, deeply painful and unpleasant. Whereas some of the most deadly venoms in the world, like um, a group of snakes called crates, which are in the cobra family, they have very strongly paralytic venoms, but they have very sharp teeth. They bite you. The venom doesn't hurt. You just become floppy and paralyzed. So uh, predatory venoms and defensive venoms evolve under different rules, and they have different effects for that reason. Yeah. And uh, especially for some... Uh for some organisms that are quite fragile, like some of them are in invertebrates we've talked about, or like even uh, ribbon worms or, or jellyfish. Uh, if you want to eat uh, something that moves around and, and stuff, it's it's no good, right? If you swallow it and then it's moving around, it might rip your body wall and uh, leave and stuff. So those venoms that are uh, for predation, what you want is to paralyze the, the prey and not necessarily go Spain, but mm. just have it there and not moving around. Absolutely. The the cone snail, I always think, is a really good example of that because it's its venom is just so, so, so powerful. But then when you think about what it's hunting, little snail, very fast fish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you can actually, uh, there's there's some videos, really cool videos on, on YouTube of uh, some of these species uh, eating fish. And you can see how they paralyze the fish, they swallow it, but then maybe the toxin effect wears off a little bit. So the fish actually starts to swim around and tries to escape. So the snail has to sting again and the toxins have to be very, very potent and very fast so that they actually paralyze immediately the fish and, and it doesn't escape. Yeah. We've, uh, we've uh, we've got lots and lots of uh, questions coming in from our for our viewers, so I'll just get through um, a few of them. We have a, a great question on uh, Facebook, very interesting. Why uh, would you think that venom is not more common across the animal kingdom, given the advantages such as defence from predators, um, efficient hunting of prey? Are there any drawbacks to being venomous? Well, one, one reason, oh, go on, sorry. No, go on, Anna, please. I would say, I would say in, in, in mammals, it's argued that um, venom what is lost in uh, the face of other weapons. So mammals have talons and tusks and very large teeth, and those are seen to be, you know, potentially more powerful or more uh, or less costly than venom. Or, or more simple to evolve than venom. So I think that's been replaced in some groups of animals. 
with other weapons. So you may lose venom, but you get another weapon. And and I guess yeah. conversely as well, if you are already quite strong and you can, for instance, uh, subdue prey just by power, then you don't need this chemical weapon because it's also quite expensive to make uh, this cocktail of chemicals. Again, an area of research, people look at it in snakes and in scorpions, but uh, in some of these groups of organisms, I saw a question pass earlier, when the venom gland is empty, then, you know, the gun is empty, they have to make new ammunition, and that costs a lot of energy and time. Uh, centipedes and snakes, it costs days to refill their weapon, and of course, that's expensive. And so maybe having big muscles is just a cheaper way of, uh, of doing things. Yeah, that was uh, that was a great question from Abigail, age six, asking uh, if animals can can actually run out of venom. But yeah, it is. It, it costs to produce, doesn't it? So, yeah, not always easy to. Yeah, not as simple as that. We'll evolve venom, and that that that's you know that that's fine. <laughs> that will make us great predators. Bit more complicated than that. Some great great questions coming through. I'll just go through a couple more um, before we move on. There's a couple for, of questions for Anna specifically on. Uh, the lorises. Um, Ariana on YouTube was asking um, if lorises are using venom against humans and, and against each other, what are their predators? Do, do they not um, use it against those? Well, lorises are incredibly slow. They are incredibly cryptic, which means their color matches their background. They don't make audible sounds. So they have very few natural predators. Probably millions of years ago, they may have had more predators. And so in the past, their venom or may have had a bigger impact against predators. And surely if a predator still were to attack a loris today, the venom is useful, but it's not the most common use of the venom. So uh, we've been studying lorises for nearly 10 years, every single night in Indonesia. And, and so by looking what they're doing every single night, although it does have multiple purposes, we've already talked about animals that have venom for multiple purposes. We know that lorises can kill ectoparasites with their venom as well. So they can kill ticks and fleas and lice, um, and they have very few ectoparasites, and they probably do have some effect against predators. But most predators of slow lorises actually kill them when they're asleep in a little ball and they're defenseless, and, uh, and they then have to go through that process of mixing saliva with their mm. oil in their arm. Um, and another question on the loris is from um, Ariana um, on YouTube. She was uh, asking, what is the damage that slow lorises cause to each other? Um, if, they're, if they're nearly killing humans through anaphylactic shock, what damage does it cause to the lorises themselves? Well, what's interesting is um, slow lorises are very rare to breed in captivity. So it's exciting when we do get them. But we've reviewed the causes of death of lorises in captivity in all European and North American zoos. Venom is the number one cause, bites are the number one cause of death. Um, and also in rescue centers, when lorises come in from illegal wildlife trade, they're transported in crates, they bite each other, and the, the venom actually causes, as you can see in the animal, especially with the incredibly open head wound, that animal was attacked actually in the wild in Java just a few weeks ago, and we don't think it survived. We haven't seen it since. Um, and so it can actually cause this necrosis of the flesh where that wound starts like that and it grows and grows and grows until the animal is almost a skull. Uh, so yeah, that incredible necrosis causes death of the animal. So death is the ultimate cause of the venom. Wow, so, so nasty. Yeah, such a, a cute looking all. animal. No, <laughs> they're not cute at all, are they? <laughs> um, Ron, Ida, we know that the, the loris, the platypus, uh, another example, they're obviously impacted by venom of their, their own species, but um, are animals generally impacted by their own venom or do they tend to be immune? Um, I, I don't think we can talk uh, in general right there. There's not that much known, but uh, there are some, yeah, like the examples that we saw that they use it to uh, fight against their own species and things like that. But uh, in some other cases, uh, the animals have evolved resistance to their own venom. Like for example, the, the poison dart frogs, although in this case, not a venomous animal, poisonous, but uh, it serves as an example. They have a very, very potent uh, neurotoxin called epiviratine. And um, the uh, 
a receptor of these toxins, which is a molecule in the cells. Um, it's evolved so that it doesn't bind to these toxins. So the toxin affects other organisms, but it doesn't bind to the target in the frog, so it doesn't affect uh, the frog itself. That's the same sort of general story for the, the other pictures, I think, in that slide. We saw the honey badger there, we saw uh, the Egyptian mongoose, we see a cobra, uh, and cobras themselves have become uh, resistant or even immune to their venom because one of the biggest paralyzing toxins, it has to bind to a target and it doesn't bind anymore, it ricochets off it. And the honey badgers who like to eat these snakes and the mongooses who like to eat these snakes also have their targets modified so the toxins ricochet off it and they don't get paralyzed. So um, evolution finds a way to solve almost any problem and sometimes in very similar ways. Absolutely. Um, uh, we had a quick question coming from Debbie on Facebook on, on that subject of immunity and asking, are opossums immune to venom? That's a contextual question, yes. Opossums are to a degree immune to the venom of rattlesnakes, vipers that they eat. So in contrast to cobras, the main uh, effect of their venom is paralysis. Uh, vipers cause internal bleeding. They just disturb your blood clotting system and your, your, your entire blood vascular system. Opossums like to snack on some of these snakes and they have factors in their blood that give them some protection against these blood uh, destroying toxins from the, from the rattlesnake venom. So that's true. Incredible. Uh, but we are, oh, we are quite short on time. We have too much to talk about it, 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 and too many questions as well. It's fantastic. But um, before we get on to more um, viewer questions, Anna, I, I did want to uh, talk briefly about uh, your work with lorises because it, because it seems an unusual angle, venom and, and conservation. So, so how, uh, explain to us how venom is relevant to, to your conservation work. Well, what's very interesting is we knew that slow lorises were very popular pets and often in the pet trade, their teeth were clipped out and, and it never, there wasn't a connection made that it was because they are venomous and that they can bite not only their owners, but they can bite each other when they're in transport. And if they bite each other when they're in transport, they have necrotic rotting flesh and they don't look very beautiful. They can't be sold. And, and so, in fact, traders say they only pick the pretty lorises. So if you've been attacked by another loris and lose your eye or your ear, you're really lucky because a trader is less likely to pick you. But also, lorises are one of the most um, traded pets. They're one of the most common uh, protected mammals in illegal trade throughout Southeast Asia in the countries where they're found. So if you go to Martin, Thailand or in Indonesia, you'll see many, many lorises. Also, they're exported as pets. And so many people don't think they're venomous. They think they're very cute and very sweet. But because their bite can harm or injure or kill a person, uh, it's very important that people know that this is yet another reason why horses shouldn't be pets. Not only are they very threatened in the wild, they belong in the wild, but they're dangerous. And I think the mm -hmm. kind of people who do like to have venomous animals as pets uh, and their reptiles and their scorpions aren't necessarily the same group of people who'd pick up a fluffy slow loris. So it's uh, something that's very important to get out there so people know. Definitely, absolutely. And yeah, the, the more people we tell about this, uh, yeah, the, the better. It's, uh, it, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating but a heartbreaking um, subject. Um, just want to get through a couple more viewer questions because we are rapidly running out of time, unfortunately. Um, we've got a question from Dan uh, on YouTube asking about the Komodo dragon, asking whether that's considered venomous given the, the bacteria living in its mouth. Is that venom? Does that qualify? Who wants to tackle this one? <laughs> well, all I can say is that actually, if you look at a, a skull of the Komodo dragon and you, you do a CT scan of the skull, you can see a, a, a part of the skull where it stores its venom that then leads to a, venom, a little duct that leads to the venom delivery system. So it's not just the bacteria in the mouth. There's actually a venom gland that's delivering venom. So there, there's sort of a myth 
in a lot of ven not just the Komodo dragon, but in other venomous taxa as well, that it's quote unquote just bacteria. But upon further look of those sort of stories, it leads you to the fact that that animal is, is really venomous. Absolutely. Uh, great, great question. Um, before we uh, have to wrap up, I do want to uh, just uh, talk about some of the, the the human uses of venom because it's a it's a fascinating subject because venom doesn't just kill, does it? It can also be used mm -hmm. to cure. So how are, are we humans using venom? Well, I don't know what slide we have on this, but um, for the last seven or eight months since we have gone into this COVID crisis, people are aware of a pharmaceutical company called AstraZeneca. We've all heard it because they are developing hopefully one of the vaccines that can bring our normal life back. And AstraZeneca are also um, marketing drugs that have been developed on the basis of venom. There's a, a big lizard called the Gila monster uh, from the southern United States. And uh, it has venom and people have and here we have on the left a uh, photograph of this uh, of, the, of this lizard. People have studied its venom, and they have developed on the basis of one of the components of the venom a treatment for type two diabetes, which is adult onset diabetes. It's to help regulate your blood sugar. That is so successful, and AstraZeneca markets that on, in two different forms. That this company earns hundreds of millions of US dollars per year just with this one venom derived drug and it improves the lives of countless of diabetes sufferers. So yes, venom evolved for nefarious purposes, but it's definitely useful uh, when you filter the badness of venom through the ingenuity of scientists. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with COVID now. Absolutely. And Ida, you were uh, telling me um, a, a little earlier about a, a really uh, interesting application of, of, of scorpion venom. Yeah, um, it's called a tumor paint, uh, and it's actually a compound that comes from the, that stalker scorpion venom. And uh, what they, uh, the researchers found out was that that particular compound binds specifically to uh, tumor cells, to cancer cells. So they had a really great idea, and what they did was uh, attach a fluorescent compound to this uh, molecule. And so when they uh, use it, when they are operating on a brain tumor, what they do is that they inject this compound, this fluorescent compound, and the compound binds to the tumor cells. So it can aid uh, surgeons to get rid of the cancer tissue and not the, the health, uh, healthy brain tissue. So it's, uh, it's because these molecules are uh, very specific uh, in many times and they actually target uh, things like like the nervous system or uh, the blood system and, and all these, they can have many different uses in, in medicine. And and yeah, this this one in particular, I think it's it's a really cool application. You can basically light up a tumor and so you know where you have to to cut. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's so, so cool. Um, I just want to finish off with a couple of uh, our viewer questions because we've had so many, so many great ones come through. Um, Darren on Facebook earlier asked, what's the old, and I don't know if you guys will, will know the answer to this, but what's the oldest known example of a venomous animal in the fossil record? Do we know? I don't know. Well, I, I would okay. guess that it is the oldest example we have of a Nidarian. That's the group of creatures that house sea anemones, jellyfish, corals. And we know that these exist, for instance, in the Burger Shale, one of the most famous fossil uh, Lagerstätte, which are exceptionally preserved fossil deposits in the world. So more than half a billion years ago. So that's um, venom entered the arena early. It really did. Um, and, and one very last question uh, from Leah on uh, Facebook. Uh, she uh, asks all of you, in your opinion, what's the weirdest venom delivery system? Mm -hmm. A lot to choose from. <laughs> I, don't know, I, think, I think it's those, the ribs coming through the reptiles. That's horrendous and insane <laughs> and unbelievable. <laughs> My favorite though. It's, it's a group of ants called the acrobat ants. They have a stinger, like 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 any uh, hymenopter and any bee wasp or some of the ants, but it's not pointy. It's like a little spoon. It's like a ladle. 
and they deposit a droplet of venom on it and it evaporates. And then, so for instance, when they hunt for other insects, they turn their little butts towards the, uh, the, the prey and the venom evaporates and gets absorbed into the skin, for instance, of a termite. And so they close in with their little butts out, closer and closer, until the termite falls over and they eat it. So they don't even actually touch the prey with their venom, but because it evaporates and has a toxic effect to which they themselves seem to be impervious, uh, that's how they do it. I, I love it. It's great. <laughs> This is amazing. This is the content that I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> but would, would we consider that venom or poison, though? Venomous or poisonous? Well, I think we need a, a beer over that one. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Poisonous, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> oh, it's, it's been fantastic chatting to you all. I'm... I'm very, very gutted that we're actually out of time, I'm afraid. There is so much more uh, left to talk about. And we had so many more uh, fewer questions. I'm, I'm so sorry that we didn't get to all of them. But it's been brilliant, amazing speaking to all of you tonight. Thank you so much uh, for, for chatting to us again. And hopefully we can have you all back on again uh, in the future, next year at some point. And uh, because there's, there is far too much to talk about. But, but thank you all so much. It's been fantastic. We will uh, say goodbye to you all for now. And thank you to you, our viewers, for all of your fantastic questions. I'm so sorry we didn't get to all of them. There were so many, but I hope that you enjoyed that panel as much as I did. We're not finished yet, though. Don't go anywhere. Our late is not over. Now that you are all experts in venom, you can totally ace our venom quiz that is coming up right now. We've called it What's Your Poison? And I'm uh, very pleased to welcome uh, to our, our stream my colleagues, Christina and Khalil, who are going to be hosting tonight. Hey. Hey. Hello. Thank you so much, guys. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this quiz. Have you got some, some tricky questions for us? Yeah, we've got some tricky ones, some that are going to be a little bit easier if people have been paying attention to the panel. But some that are a little curveball-y as well. I was going to say, if they weren't paying attention, they would guess some of the questions. So there will be some <laughs> there for them. Fantastic. I, I look forward to it. Well, I, I will uh, say goodbye to now. Uh, for now. I'll hand you over to the uh, the very capable hands of Khalil and Christina. Really looking forward to the quiz. Uh, the quiz. I will uh, see you guys a bit later. Bye. Bye, Alison. So welcome to the second part of tonight's Natural History Museum Lates Online. Uh, thanks so much to Alison and her guests for that fascinating delve into the amazing world of nature's chemical weapons. Now, I hope you got your thinking caps on, because for the next half hour or so, Christina and I are going to be quizzing you on your knowledge of poisons, venoms, all manner of toxins. Don't worry, though, you don't have to be an expert like our panellists, but some of these questions will be a little bit easier if you were paying attention. Uh, Christina, how's the quiz going to work? Right, so if you have been uh, with us in other lates, you will know the drill, but for those of you who are new, we are going to have three rounds and tonight we are going to have three questions per round. Now, that is a total of nine questions. Now, most of the questions uh, will be a value of one point, except if we say differently and, and we'll make it really, really clear. But what we're going to do is just uh, run through the first round questions and then give you the first round questions answers. So we'll give you the answers of, of the questions after each round to keep you on your feet to see that competition there. So because of we, we, we want you competing, make sure that you don't give the answers away on the chat because you might be ruining the, the uh, quiz for other people or actually giving them a lot of advantage. So do, uh, do not tell the answers in the chat. And um, also, do not look up questions on Google. I mean, you can do whatever you like. That's up to you um, and up to your pride. Um, and what we really, really love to hear are your team names. We love to hear your team names. You always come up with great team names, so send them through. So yeah, uh, I think that's all the all the things to bear in mind before the show. Grab pencil and a piece of paper um, and get ready because we're going to start with the first round. Bite or be beaten? And Khalil is going to hit you with the first question. I, for one, cannot wait for those team names to start coming in. Every time we do a quiz, we get some absolute corkers. But let's get going ahead with the questions. 
So the first question of round one. The terms venom and poison are often used interchangeably, but there is a difference, as you heard earlier in the panel. The main distinction is how they're delivered. Poisons tend to be small molecules that can be absorbed through things like your skin, eyes, or gut. And venoms, on the other hand, tend to include bigger molecules that can't get through the skin on their own, so they need a bit of help from a sting, a fang, or anything else that makes an opening to deliver the venom. So the question we're going to ask you is, can you name an animal that is both poisonous and venomous? And I think there was an example in the panel earlier, but there are other examples as well for anyone who's got some outside knowledge. There you go. There were a few examples there, and we'll we'll give you the point if, if you uh, guess the the right ones. There's a few there's a few animals uh, that are both both poisonous and venomous out there. So hopefully you can guess them. Um, and there's also one that we couldn't put anywhere as well. So. I mean, I will give people points if they mention that one as well. <laughs> We're going to be very generous with the points on this one. <laughs> but uh, let's move on to the second question. Now, a lot of venomous bites and a sting can cause you pain. Uh, and that pain can range from a mild inconvenience to excruciating agony. Now, the problem is that's up to you. How do we compare pain? So there's been one entomologist, Justin Schmidt, who took upon it himself to develop a pain scale. Yeah, you heard me right. They uh, they decided to be bitten and stung and describe that pain. Now, in that scale, uh, it ranges from one to four, and four is the most painful uh, stung or a sting or bite that you can have. Um, and uh, the, uh, he places different insects on that scale. So what we want you to do on this question is match the pain described by Schmidt to the animal that inflicted it. And for this question, we're going to give you one point per one match, correct match that you do. So I'm going to tell you the names of the animals and then Kalil and I are going to read you the descriptions of the pain. Now we have the sweat bee, we have the bullet ant, we have the warrior wasp and we have the western yellow jacket. You'll see them in a picture next. And then here are the different descriptions of the pain. So see if you can match the insect with the pain. Uh, Kelly will hit them with the first one. So the first one is hot and smoky, almost irreverent. Imagine WC Fields extinguishing a cigar on your tongue. Now, that's a kind of a niche reference. I had to Google W.C. Fields, but he was a comedian from the 1920s who was known for being irreverent and uh, and a little bit kind of coarse. There you go. Good clarification. I that. think the cigar is the important part there. Whoever's the putting a cigar important. out on your tongue, it's going to hurt. <laughs> right. Let's go for the next one. Get ready for this one. Because it's torture. You are chained in the flow of an active volcano. Why did I start this list? There's a feeling there, I think, Leo. I think there's, uh, yeah. Uh, not there are only... some great descriptions there, but I think that's my favourite. The reflection, yeah. <laughs> when a sting makes you regret your life choices, for an entomologist, I think that's a big step. So the third one is pure, intense, brilliant pain, like walking over flaming charcoal with a three-inch nail embedded in your feet. That sounds pretty intense. Uh, I don't think as is intense as the active volcano, but <laughs> true. We'll leave it there. Yeah, if you had a choice between flaming charcoal and a volcano. Uh, no, but I did have a nail embedded in my foot, and it's not that bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and the last one, I think this one is quite sweet. Light, ephemeral, almost fruity. A tiny spark has singed a single hair on your arm. I think the beginning is, is a lot like the description of a wine and then the <laughs> spark there at the end. So yeah, I find this one really, really sweet, especially compared with the other, even the other three. Yeah, um, if I had to pick one, I would I'd probably definitely go for the fourth one. The, the fruity one. Hmm. Um, so yeah, these are the four different descriptions of pain. I think you can get a feeling of, of what our entomologist was feeling and you have to match them with uh, the four different insects that we have there. So we have a sweat bee, a bullet and a warrior wasp 
and a western yellow jacket. Hopefully you've never been beaten by one of them, but if you had, you might recognise uh, the pain that Schmidt is describing. Uh, but I think we've gi li uh, given them enough time to think, so maybe let's move to the third question, Kalil. Sure, so the third and final question of this first round is mm. a little bit simpler than the second question, which is kind of convoluted. This one, we just want you. We just want you to tell us which of these animals you think is the most venomous. So we have the hackled orb weaver spider, the American short-tailed shrew, the vulture bee, or the northern water snake. Now, each of these groups of animals uh, has venom, but we want to know that specific species, uh, the different kind of uh, um, uh, amounts and, and dangers of venom that they produce. So just pick which one you think is the most venomous. That's tricky because they look really venomous. You see pictures and you're like, mm. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure I'd want to super duper hang out with uh, each one of those really, but you know, to each their own. So that rounds out our questions for the first round. So if you've all got your answers down, let's hit you up with the answers to the first round, Christina. Brilliant. So let's start uh, with the first question. We asked you about uh, animals that were both poisonous and venomous. We talked about them during the uh, panel discussion, so you might have had some clues there, but you might have your own knowledge about them. Uh, so for one point, so you get, you get one point if you get um, any of these right. Um, but some examples uh, can be the Asian tiger snake, for example, the blue ring octopus, the spitting cobra, uh, soil centipedes, they're called jugulus, um, and we will also take in the head button frog um, if anyone has written in it, uh, because they talk about it in the in the discussion as well, and it's a little bit in there. And also, if you mention um, that, um, I think it was called the acrobatic ant that kind of evaporates his venom. I think we'll consider that right because he meant that you were paying attention. Personally, I'm inclined to take the headbutting frog or the uh, bum venom ant as an answer to any question, just because I think they're great. <laughs> <laughs> they were brilliant. I've never heard about those ants now, and I think they've become my favourite um, animal. But for some of you, um, yeah, so the, the uh, headbutting frog are amazing, um, evaporating venom ants as well. Uh, but these other animals as well, they... For example, the Asian tiger snake has a venomous bite, but is also poisonous. So if you eat it, um, it will also be uh, poisonous for it, um, for you. And um, why, what was it? I guess is the is the whole body of it poisonous, or just the like the the venom glands at the front? Well, actually, this one feeds on poisonous toads and takes the toxins, so it uses it to defend itself. So pretty clever, um, I know that. Um, and then I suppose it will be the whole the whole body. And then we have the blue ring octopus as well, which is really cool, makes its own venom, um, as any other squids and octopuses, but also it has a tetrodotoxin uh, that it acquires from bacteria, um, and it makes it also really poisonous for any predator that might um, eat, in, eat it. And then we have the centipedes, soil centipedes, that have uh, claws, venomous claws on their heads, but also they have glands that um, on, on the belly surface that um, deliver that poison as well if, if they get predated on. So yeah, pretty, pretty cool animals here. Um, Khalil, we had some names sent through. We've got the venom extractors, and the poisonous pioneers. I do like an alliteration like that. So those, those are both great names. Yeah, Answer please keep sending us your far. names. So the second question in this uh, first section, we've got the answers for you here. This was the question about the Schmidt pain index. So let's get these descriptions matched to these insects. So first of all, we had the sweat bee, number one. That was D, the light, ephemeral, almost fruity sting. A tiny spark has singed a single hair on your arm. And, you know, it does look like quite a dainty uh, a dainty little bee. So maybe it kind of fits. B, uh, number two, the bullet ant was C, the pure, intense, brilliant pain, like walking over flaming charcoal with a three-inch nail in your heel. 
That sounds that sounds pretty intense. In fact, the bullet ant is uh, is the first insect that ever got a four, the highest rating on the Schmidt Pain Index. Other insects have since gained that same level, and because there's only a four point scale, it's hard to tell the difference between them. But I don't know. Unless someone's going to volunteer and go back and retest all of these, <laughs> I think we're going to have to stick at that. Three, the warrior wasp was B, torture. Why did I start this list? And four, the Western yellow jacket was the hot and smoky irreverent one. So bullet out and warrior wasp, they sound pretty bad, both from their names and from the descriptions of their stings. I mean, the bullet ant was called the bullet ant because it feels like being shot. So, I mean, I've never been shot or stung by a bullet ant, but the, apparently the pain from a bullet ant sting can last up to 24 hours, but a human victim is it will likely walk away alive, but you're probably not going to go near a bullet ant nest ever again. That's it. And I think a lot of people won't agree with the jello jacket, gentle um, sting. So yeah, well, I bet some people will disagree with that scale, but obviously they wouldn't. Have I guess once you've been stung by a warrior wasp, a Western yellow jacket, <laughs> it's not really going to register, is it? It's not that much. Yeah, likely I can't say either way. <laughs> That's fine. Um, and the answer to our third question for the first round, this one, we were being a little bit naughty here. We were asking you what is the, uh, the worst, um, the, 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 the most venomous of these animals. And you will be surprised that it's actually the shrew. And even though the other animals look very uh, venomous, um, and they, they do come from groups, that uh, we usually associate with uh, venomous bites or stings. These are actually examples of a species that are not venomous in within those groups. So yeah, don't judge the the animal by its cover. They might not be venomous. But shrews, on the other side, they use uh, the neurotoxic venom for food storage. So they store paralyzed prey in the burrows, and this way they keep it fresh. Uh, a little bit longer um, and they can uh, devour it later. So yeah, um, especially in winter, that's, that can come quite handy for for the shrew. So you wouldn't, I hope that you weren't expecting that. <laughs> I don't know, it is getting cold. Maybe I need to go and, I don't know, uh, paralyze some prey and store well, it in a burrow for the winter. I don't no. think shrews have fridges though, Khalil, so <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, I'd probably get put on the list for that. So I guess anyway, that's the, go ahead. Yeah, um, no, just that I was going to say, that's the end of the first round um, and you could get a top of six points on that round. So please do tell us how many points you got, how how were you doing? Um, so yeah, share your point with us um, and we would love to to hear that and keep sending your um, amazing names. But we can move Yeah, on. we want to hear shout outs of how your teams are doing. I mean, Venom Extractors and Poisonous Pioneers, who's winning so far? I think Christina's rooting for the poisonous pioneers, so I'm going to have to go for the venom extractors just to be contrary. That's fine. That's fine. We can we can have a little bit of competition ourselves as well. Uh, but I think we can move to round two, and we've got toxic tactics. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Khalil? So this is around all about different ways that we uh, that uh, organisms use uh, venoms and poisons, and. Just because you're not venomous or poisonous yourself doesn't mean you can't still use toxins to your advantage. So this is about tricksy ways that other organisms take advantage of the chemical weapons evolved by other species. So Christina, why don't you uh, start us off with question one. Before the first question, we're going to ask you to actually spot the myths. Now, some harmless animals actually have evolved to look very sim similar to uh, dangerous venomous creatures. So we've got a good example here with um, the coral snake and its mimic. Um, and But we have uh, put together some other examples as well in, in this group of pictures. Um, and they, I can say, they are pretty well disguised. What we're going to ask you is, from the next pictures that we're going to show you, can you spot the harmless non-venomous animals? Um, and I'm don't know whether to tell them how many of them uh, there are there, but let's do it. There are two <laughs> harmless, not venomous animals in the next picture. See if you can spot them. 
Um, and we'll give you one point for each of the um, mimic that you find there, the non-venomous animal. Let's see if we can have that picture on the uh, thing. So yeah, from those six insects, you've got two who are harmless, who can't sting you. I mean, to the naked eye, they all it's look so like tricky. bees, wasps, hornets, that type of thing. What with, They're all what, black and what, yellow. Yeah. And this is the group that Ron was talking about earlier when he was talking about Hymenoptera. So that's uh, these, uh, yeah, wasps, hornets, bees, and ants. And I suppose if you've ever been, uh, you know, stung by a yellow jacket or any other kind of wasp, every time you see something even remotely similar to it, you're going to step back um, and try not to approach it. So that's, that's the point of, of these animals there. They make the predators think that they can hurt them. So they get away with it without actually having to spend any energy on creating venom. Um, so see, two of them, two of the ones over there, won't do anything to you. And they're difficult to spot, actually. Hmm. We'll see. So but, question two, shall we? I think we've given them enough time to spot these mimics. So question two, some organisms get their poisons and venoms through slightly underhanded means. Uh, for example, poison dart frogs get some of their toxins from uh, the insects in their diets and the, the alkaloid chemicals in there. One of the organisms on this list coming up steals its venom from one of the others, but which pair is it? So we want two answers, one for the venom producer and one for the venom thief. But you'll only get the point if you get both right. So we have an underwater selection for you today. We've got the stonefish, the sea swallow, the Portuguese man of war, and the sea urchin. So which of these steals its venom from the other? I actually uh, I actually have a tattoo of one of these ones. Guess which one it is. <laughs> you won't get a bonus point for it, but you get a thumbs up from me. <laughs> That's brilliant. This is tricky, but again, if they were watching the show, they would know because we've mentioned it. And I think it, it was it was picked as one of the most incredible ways of um, getting getting your your venom. So it, it is really, really cool. Yeah, now, I'm I think gonna... we move on to the third question, Khalil. Mm -hmm. Over to you. Cool. So uh, humans will also steal venom from from nature uh, and use it in its own benefits. So, um, and this can be traced back to antiquity. So one of his first uses was coating arrow tips uh, to slow kill enemy, enemy enemies when they when they got hit by the. Arrows. So Scythian warriors used this tactic 2,000 years ago, that's a while ago. And although venom was not the only thing coating the arrows, um, the sword is believed to have uh, concocted a horrifying mixture of viper venom, human blood, animal feces, um, and yeah, a, a, a weird mix over there. So it might have not just been the venom that was killing you. If getting um, stabbed wasn't bad enough, you're getting stabbed you with that. poo, blood and venom. Well, not only that, Khalil, they left this to putrefy underground before actually applying it to the arrows. Oh, so it was rotten poo, rotten blood and rotten venom. Yeah, so I think that's a, up a level to the, the venom arrows that you You've have. got to really hate someone to do that. Yeah, I think at least one of the things will kill you. <laughs> so, for one point, what toxic military tactic was once used by famous Carthaginian general Hannibal against his enemies? So we're going to give you three options here um, and see if you can guess it. So we are going to give you one, throwing snake field pots onto enemy ships, two, dropping venomous insects onto attacking forces, or three, fired snake venom tip flaming arrows. So independently of uh, the system uh, of coating arrows on um, rotting blood, pieces and venom. Uh, what did Hannibal, uh, how did Hannibal use venom against his enemies? And you've got through your... I mean, all of those would be pretty intense. They sound not horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any one of those would make me stop attacking Carthage. Like, Well, they didn't have any guns, so they have to find other ways of... <sighs> yeah, I think we've, we've got enough ways <laughs> of making people feel pain. <laughs> 
Brilliant. But that's the last question of our round two. So I think we can move on to the answers. Well, we've received some of, of the um, points that our different uh, teams are, have gotten. My poisonous pioneers are on three at the moment, Khalil. Oh, but the Venom Extractors <laughs> pulling ahead with five. Also, we've got a third team entering the race, the Snake Bites. Love the name. Three points as well. So there's still a lot to play for. There's still... 10 more points I think to come so it's all it's all it's all still to play for but <laughs> go venom extractors <laughs> going into the answers for the second round let's start off with that mimic question so if we bring up the image again we've got these six insects that all kind of look like bees or wasps but actually the one on the top left is a bee mimic hoverfly and so it's actually just a fly. Um, you can tell because it has uh, it has short, straight antennae, whereas a bee tends to have longer, bent ones. Also, flies only have one pair of wings, whereas bees have two, although they're quite close together, they're so quite it's close together. hard to tell. Uh, on the middle bottom is a mm. hornet moth. That's actually a moth. Uh, and normally we have see moths with big scaly wings, but this is called a uh, a hornet clearwing moth, and it's a large moth native to, native to Europe and the Middle East, and it's as big as a hornet, so pretty sizable, and it even mimics the hornet's kind of jerky flight pattern when it's disturbed. Um, although it's it's more yellow than a hornet, and it doesn't have that pinched-in waist that all the Hymenoptera have. But pretty convincing mimics, though, enough to put you off messing with any of these. There you go. I think the... I think hoverflies we're a little bit more um, familiar with, but when you see that moth, it just blows your mind. It's so similar to a wasp. You definitely want to play close to that. It's quite big as well. So, Christina, how many points were up for grabs in that question? Was that I one for each? Two, two, one for each. Yeah, so you can get two, two points. One for the flight, one for the moth. Awesome. Let's go to question two. Now, question two, I know that this one was your favorite question, Khalil. And uh, uh, we were asking you which of these two organisms or which which organism bites, um, sorry, takes the venom from which other organism from uh, this list. And uh, the answer was, is the sea swallow and the Portuguese man of war. So the sea swallow, um, actually, uh, which belongs to the, the group of sea slugs, they're also called uh, nudibranchs, they, they have a cunning way of har harvesting the stinging cells from the venomous organisms that they feed on. Things like jellyfish, anemones, corals, and the Portuguese man of war, which, by the way, is not a jellyfish, it's something called a siphonophore. Um, and they're all their own uh, thing. So these stinging cells that they take for the Portuguese man of war are extracted and stored in those finger-like protrusions that they have. They look like a little bit like wing, uh, and they he help them defend from anything that one might want to eat them. So there you go. That's that's a very clever way of of getting poison with uh, a venom uh, without actually having to produce it yourself. Especially if you're a little squishy sea slug like that. And actually, on this side, I have two of those little... Oh, God, my hand. I, uh, I have two of those <laughs> sea swallows. And the answer to the uh, the Khalil bonus question that's not worth any points, that's the thing I have a tattoo of. Uh, a little sea swallow swimming towards a very big jellyfish. But on to the third and final question of our second round. So we asked you, what tactic... Uh, the Carthaginian general, Hannibal Barker, the same guy who led the elephants over the Alps to attack Rome, uh, what did he use against his enemies? <clears throat> and he's considered one of the greatest military commanders in history, and he had all sorts of adventurous tactics, like I said, leading elephants over the, the Alps. But in naval battles, he once commanded his crew to throw snake-filled pots onto the enemy ships so they'd shatter, and given the close confines on a ship, it proved pretty effective in delivering both the element of surprise and some life-threatening bites from confused, angry snakes. And if you ever want to meet a snake, you don't want it to be confused or angry. Uh, like a similar-ish tactic, which was uh, the, the second option, was also employed 
uh, but you know, in a different uh, setting, in the siege of Hatra in the year 198, which is a, a fortress city in, in present day Iraq uh, against the invading Romans. The inhabitants of Hatra rained baskets full of venomous insects and scorpions down on the attacking Roman army as they climbed up the ladders on the walls. And just like a lot of things in this quiz, I think that would be enough to put me off. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I would rather have scorpions and snakes thrown to me or boiling oil. Um, yeah, it depends on how um, Schmidt would describe it because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what, what, what scorpions, what insects, what oil? <laughs> exactly. So that brings us to the uh, the end of the answers for the second round. Do tell us uh, how the scores are coming along. I want to see whether the, uh, the, the, what was it? The snake bites, the poison pioneers, the venom extractors, or any of the other teams in the running. I want to hear how you're doing. We want to get that competition going. But... We've still got one more round of questions to go, so the things could totally change on the leaderboard. Christina, why don't you hit us up with one? Right, so we're moving, in, uh, moving into Killer and Cure. And this round has also uh, about six points as well, so pay attention because if you're not doing that well, you can um, get back in into the game with this because we are, all, again, talking about things that we, we talked about on the, on the panel discussion. Uh, we are going to talk about how, you know, Venoms are uh, cocktails of chemicals, and as Ron explained really well on the panel, when they get into your body and react with our own chemicals, it's what makes them really, really dangerous for us, is what creates that toxic reaction uh, that they are famous for, or, or actually dangerous for. But um, by studying and understanding these cocktails of chemicals, scientists have been able to identify useful compounds that can the base of medicines and treatments that can actually be useful for our health. So we're going to ask you a few questions on that. And Khalil, I'm going to let you ask them the first question. Yeah, so we've been talking a lot about kind of uh, animals that produce toxins, but let's go microscopic. So the botulinum toxin is a toxin produced by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum, the same bacterium that causes the disease botulism. And this is the most powerful toxin humans have ever discovered. And it can kill humans in very low doses. So it might surprise you that this toxin is actually better known as Botox, the thing that people inject into their faces to get rid of wrinkles. But the question I want to ask you is, what effect does this toxin have that makes it so useful for smoothing out wrinkles and killing people? Is it A, that it constricts your blood vessels? Is it B, that it stops your muscles contract? Uh, con contracting? Or is it C, that it fills spaces between the skin and the rest of the organs? So all of these would probably be not super great if it was injected into you, but all of them also could have effects on your skin. So either you know, or it's a roll of the dice. I don't, I always wonder how many people know when they're injecting themselves with Botox, what Botox come from. Um, and because it makes you, yeah, double think. But obviously all these things are done very carefully and super controlled and obviously doctors know what they're injecting and, and how they're injecting. This is a perfect example of how the, the poison is really in the dose. There are so many things that we use as medicines or as foodstuffs or, or things like that that in too big an amount will kill you. Um, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's painkillers or uh, any other kind of uh, you know medicine that we put in our bodies, if you that's, that's why there's such thing as an overdose. But with Botox, it's just a tiny, 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 tiny overdose. Exactly, and uh, Khalil, actually, that link links really nicely with the next question because Botox can not only be used cosmetically to smooth wrinkles, but also to treat chronic pain and uh, things like strabismus. So when your eyes go in different direction. But many natural toxins are used to treat different health conditions, just like uh, Botox. So what we're going to ask you on the next question is whether you can match the venomous species that produces a toxin that can be used to treat um, a health issue. So match the animal with the health issue that the, uh, its toxins um, can treat. And we're giving you four animals 
and full uh, uh, health issues that are treated with uh, these animal toxins. And for each guess, you will get one point. So with the, on this question, again, you can get a total of four points. Um, and for these, we have the Gila monster, the, sorry, the cone snake, the Gila monster, the uh, Jararaka pip viper, and the short-tailed shrew. And uh, for the health issues, we have high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, chronic pain, and cancer. So as I said before, the toxins that these animals produce for the defense and uh, to predate on other animals are used to treat these health issues. And you have to match the animal with the health. We've got a real spread of health conditions there that, that we're looking at. <clears throat> you know, we've got chronic pain, which is like a really complex kind of neurological set of symptoms. We've got cancer, which again is... You know, it's 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 a it's got lots of different kind of ways that it can express itself, and then kind of high blood high blood pressure, which is can be a symptom of loads of other stuff, but isn't necessarily a cause of stuff, and then type two diabetes, which is an acquired thing. It's not you know something that 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 is kind of uh, that kind of that is is uh, there from the very beginning. So these are totally different different health conditions from each other. Um, and also, Kaleo, I think it's important to mention here that, um, as, I, as we said before, um, animal venoms are a cocktail of loads of chemicals. So to produce these uh, medicines and these treatments, actually these venoms are purified, refined and modified as well. So they only use um, essential parts of those venoms to, to um, produce these treatments um, and to extract the actual beneficial compounds. Um, that can be used. So this doesn't mean that the fact that we use these these venoms as base for treatments doesn't mean that if you get beaten by the animal uh, or stung by the animal, you will get you will get um, cured of this um, health issue. So it, even when we do give you the answer, don't go getting bitten just because you're sick. Exactly. <laughs> Brilliant. So we're going to the last question of the quiz. Khalil, do you want to do the honors? Yeah, so before we go into the last question, should we do some to a score update? We've had a bit of a score update from some of our teams. So uh, we've had a new team enter the enter the running, which is the Toxic Tricotter, which I, I think is a great name. Um, I don't think we've got a total score for them yet, but I'm sure that'll come in at the end. We, uh, the Snake Bites are on six points. The Poisonous Pioneers, still on five. But who knows? This rate, this round could push them upwards. The venom extractors, ten points. Ten. Going They're great, guys. Leaves. You're doing, doing me great. proud, venom extractors. Thank you. So we're going to go into the final question, and then the answers for the final round, and then we're going to need your final scores so that we can have a bit of a chat about that. So the last question is: the more we understand about venom, the more uses of it we find, and they're not just limited to medicine. Researchers are finding uses in all sorts of other fields. So out of the three following uses, which of these is not currently a use for molecules that are found in venom? So A, um, as vehicle fuel, B, to detect explosives, or C, to, to dissolve acrylic nails? Oh, I'm not wearing mine today, but next time. Neither. So, uh, which of these do you think is not currently a use for the mole for molecules that are found in venom? And like Christina said at the end of the last question, we're not saying that we're gonna that, that people are taking the pure venom and extracting it from these organisms and immediately using it in these things. Often it is uh, molecular mechanisms that are uh, derived from and inspired from these venoms. So I think that's got enough time for you to answer this question. Christina, should we give them the final batch of answers? I think we can move on to the final answers. And again, please send us your points. We're really enjoying this competition that we have over here with the, uh, uh, the, the different teams and the great names as well. Uh, but I think we're going to start revealing the answers of, of the last round. And let's start with the first one. So we were asking you, what is the effect that Botox or the botulinum <coughs> toxin has on our bodies and why so little? And the answer is actually B. It causes something called flaccid paralysis of 
the muscle. So it makes the muscles stop contracting and relax. Um, and in the very, very low doses that are, are applied as a cosmetic, this paralysis, where basically what it does is stop areas of the face from wrinkling. And in the lethal doses produced by the bacterium, which are not that high, but are already lethal, it can cause organs from, uh, it stops organs working correctly, things like your lungs or your heart, and therefore um, the, the death. Um, and that, so, so Flaccid paralysis lethal. gets us all in the end. Moving on to question two. Um, question two, we were asking you uh, to match up the venomous organisms to the health conditions that their venom is being researched as uh, remedies for. So if we can get up these images again, we had the uh, Gila mon so the, the, sorry, the cone snail, we'll start from the top one. Uh, we've got the, the, the neurotoxic cone snail venom uh, has been used to create a drug that blocks the transmission of pain signals and can be used to treat chronic pain. Uh, and the the Gila monster, as we said in the panel discussion, uh, can has been uh, its venom has been developed into a, a very successful drug that uh, adapts the body's ability to release its own insulin as a treatment for type two diabetes. The uh, what's next? Oh, the Jalakara pit viper. So. Uh, the, the venom of that viper helps the snake capture its prey by lowering the victim's blood pressure, crashing it down, and making the victim unable to escape. And so, obviously, this could be used as a treatment for high blood pressure in the right circumstances. And the short-tailed shrew. Uh, so, venom from that shrew is undergoing clinical, clinical trials at the moment for the treatment of uh, various cancers because, actually, researchers have found that it can inhibit the proliferation of cancer cells and even kill cancer cells, which is really exciting, but it's still undergoing trials. So we'll see what happens. There you go. So uh, one question for each one that you got right. So that's a total of, uh, sorry, one point for each one of, of those that you got right. So that's a total of four points that you could have gotten right on uh, that, that question. Uh, but let's move to the last question, the answer of the last question of the quiz, which was what um, what are the different uses of uh, what is the what is not a use of one uh, of, of venom molecules that scientists have found um, and the answer is actually C uh, venom or venom molecules haven't hasn't been used to dissolve acrylic nails. I mean I'm not sure if anyone has tried uh, but as far as we know it can be used to remove acrylic nails. Or but, maybe someone has tried a lot of venoms, but they haven't found the one venom that does work. Exactly. I mean, it's all about trying, although, again, be really, really careful with it. <laughs> what is really cool is that um, formic acid, which is the venom that ants produce, and it's, it's, it's a very simple molecule made of um, um, carbon, oxygen and hydrogen. Um, it's turned out to be really, really useful and can be used to power hydrogen fuel cells in electric vehicles in a very, very green and ecological way. Um, so basically the formic acid, acid used is uh, generated artificially, so it is not taken from the ants, but the molecule that they use is the same as the ant venom. And Although I really think someone should invent an ant-powered car. I mean, it's the same thing. It's called that would be amazing. Just have an ant's nest under the bonnet. <laughs> Um, and and yeah, it's it's at the moment they have been developed and seeing if if it works and it's if it it seems it does work. Um, and on the other hand, scientists have been trialing the use of some proteins found in bee venom to make explosive detectors that are much more efficient uh, than the ones that we're using now. So these protein the, the proteins that they use the fragments of these uh, proteins from venom um, basically researchers in the MIT. Uh, have developed a uh, detector that is so sensitive that can actually pick up a single molecule of TNT. So it's a very, very sensitive uh, venom, sorry, TNT detector. Very useful again. And these are things that scientists are looking into and seeing how they can work. I am constantly amazed at the variety of applications that can be found for 
biologically inspired molecules and structures and stuff like that. Nature is amazing. So it's, and it's only by actually trying to understand these things that we still don't understand fully that we, we managed to, to find um, new uses and, and ways of, of learning from nature, I think. Um, Absolutely. Really I'm, a, I'm, I'm looking at some of the, the scores coming in. So the snake bites have a total of 12. The poisonous pioneers have a total of 13. Toxic wow. triquata on 12. Where are the venom extractors? Come on, don't let me down, guys. <laughs> and that's out of a total of 16 points. I think they've done really, really well. They've done really yeah. well a few uh, rounds. Well done. Oh, venomous frogs venomous team frogs. are on nine. Well done. I think we've keep it on your pitched, toes. I think we've probably pitched this quiz pretty well because people have been doing pretty well, but not too well. Still just difficult enough. <laughs> Hopefully people were watching the panel discussion at the beginning and, and they got some answers from there. Um, I'm really curious to know what's happening with them. Um, with the Venom Extractors. extractors. Come but on guys, don't I'm, leave I'm hanging. I'm so proud. So proud of uh, Poisonous Pioneers who took back all those points and, and yeah, that's, that's a really, really good mark out of 16. That's brilliant. Um, well, we hear from the Venom Extractors um, oh, oh, the nerd wizard has 15 points, which is very impressive. Apparently really studying bad. animal care at college has done them well. There also being a wizard probably helps. <laughs> I, I think by the comments, it seems that people have been um, enjoying, uh, enjoying the, the, the quiz. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it. So do tell us if you, if you have enjoyed the quiz. And um, there you go, the Venom Extractors. Oh, Nerd Wizard was the Venom well. Extractors. Ah, uh, okay. Nice. The Venom Extracting Wizard, who happens to be a nerd and got 15. I think we have a champion. Well we done to champion. all of our teams. And thank you so much for all the, the engagement, all the comments, all the questions that have come in all night. Um, and for sticking with us for the quiz. Because, uh, you know, it's been like a, over an hour now. Obviously, Venom is that interesting. But yeah, you had excellent names as well. I think Kaleo and I have also really, really enjoyed doing this quiz and, and hearing from you. Um, and But Kaleo, this is our last late of the year, sadly. But we've got we, to take a break at some a point. We have to take a break, but we've finished the year with, with, a, with a bank, I feel. This was really, really fun. And we'll be back in uh, to, uh, 2021, so next year. So yeah. Keep an eye out for us because... And we've got some fun plans for next year as well. Exactly. For how we we'll be bringing... give you new content and new formats and keep things spicy for you. We'll keep bringing our scientists and putting them a little bit on the spot and asking them difficult questions. And we want to hear your questions for them as well. So yeah, uh, keep an eye out and tune in when we get back in 2021 uh, because we're really, really looking forward to it. In the meantime, uh, you have all our lates and also on Nature Live Online, so chats with scientists in our YouTube channel archive and uh, the Facebook uh, page of the Natural History Museum and in the video section. So you can check them out. Um, refresh a little bit on the review, uh, review a little bit all your knowledge for next year for future panels and future events. Uh, but Khalil, I think we can say goodbye now and... Yeah, I mean, just a quick reminder for them to keep an eye on our social channels, Twitter, yes. Instagram, Facebook, uh, our YouTube channel, just for any updates um, for new content, either from us or from the other teams at the museum, because there's all sorts of uh, content still coming out over December, while me, Christina, Alison and Alistair will be taking a little bit of a break. <laughs> but thank you so much. Yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. And good night. And good night.